So we're going to move into Romanesque period of the medieval time, and we're going to be looking at appropriation. So that's basically where we borrow from another style and transform it. Innovation, so things that have changed. And then, of course, experimentation, which you probably have an idea of what that is. And so we're using that to look at Romanesque church construction. So the Romanesque time period is a relatively short time. It's about 100 years from about 1050 to 1150. And so the art style, you can read uh, or go to um, crash course and watch a video about the Dark Ages. John Green talks about this time period. Um, so just a couple of things about this style. Romanesque is usually used for architecture. We don't really normally talk about art being Romanesque in terms of painting or sculpture, um, but we will see a sculptural object from this time period as well. So there was a lot of money spent on architecture. There is very much regional style. So you'll see that there's not just going to be one style that you see throughout, but you'll see that a lot of it is dictated by the resources and the local taste. You'll see influence of early Christian, Byzantine, Islamic, and then of course some of the Celtic and Germanic heritage that we just talked about previously with early medieval. Okay, so context, a little background of the Romanesque. Um, this was a new period of stability um, due to the end of the barbarian invasions, keeping in mind that barbarians basically are non-Roman people. Um, another thing is that this was around the millennium, so 1000 CE. Now you guys are all too young to know about the year 2000, but I lived through the year 2000 and a lot of people thought that the world was going to end. Um, all of our money and finances that are all tied up to computers would be um, lost in the digital world. And a lot of people thought that um, you know, it was just gonna be lots of death, destruction, poverty, and so on. And then it didn't happen. So in, at 1000, people pretty much thought the same thing. They thought that maybe the end of world that is described in Revelations might happen. And then when people made it through, they were super, super excited. And one way that they did that was through their religious devotion. So after 1000, a lot of Christians decided to start taking religious pilgrimages to holy places. And so typically they would want to go to the Holy Land. So the places of like Bethlehem and Jerusalem, but many people weren't um, wealthy enough to do that. So they would travel around Europe and go on different pilgrimages. So many cities were kind of competing with each other in order to get new, the, the newest, the biggest, the best church, as well as um, relics. So objects of um, either coming from the actual body of a holy figure, or maybe something like a part of the true cross or a part of Mary Shroud. So a lot of cities were competing for tourists and pilgrims. Um, this is also the time of the Crusades, where they were pillaging um, these ancient um, lands. And sadly, um, you know, a lot of times, well, I shouldn't say sadly, um, a lot of times we think about the Crusades um, going into Islamic territories, but often they'd actually just steal from other Christians. So this is a time of pillaging of places like Constantinople. This is also a time of a rise of intellectualism. So uh, many wealthy people gained their education from monasteries, but also we have our very first universities being established during this time. So places like Oxford and Cambridge came to, um, out of the Romanesque time period. Many people in, especially in Northern Europe, um, were governed by the feudal system. So the feudal system is where you'd have um, powerful landowners who would basically take care of people who lived in the countryside. And so you would basically pay taxes for protection. 
Um, we have rise in populations due to um, agricultural innovations, um, people moving into cities, we have new jobs, and we have a lot of economic growth due to trade and just general prosperity. So why would a Christian travel along these pilgrimage routes at a great, great cost to their private um, income as well as their time? Um, they wanted to show their religious um, dedication. And so this is a map of what the European pilgrimage routes look like. And there was basically four major routes that took you to Santiago de Capistela in Spain. And it was along the coast. And so the theme for Romanesque is build it block by block and they will come. So these were pilgrimage churches. So these were large ch um, churches built for religious devotion and people to come and visit them as they make their way to Santiago de Capistela. Um, we have an explosion of church construction because of those competitions between the cities for those pilgrims. You know, people would want you to come because you would spend money on food and um, places to stay and souvenirs. The style, Romanesque, obviously has some Roman characteristics. So we see things like barrel and groin vaults, massive scale, rounded arches, large stones, weighted designs. And then um, in your study guide, I'm going to show you a bunch of, and, and in this presentation, a bunch of different churches and how you can tell them apart. You don't really need to focus on this because we will um, be looking at um, just one Romanesque church, but I want to show you some others as well. Feel free to take notes, but you don't need to. All right. So this is the church that people were trying to get to. This is Santiago de Capistela in Spain. Um, the style on the outside is actually not Romanesque, it's Baroque, which shows you that many of these churches were built for hundreds upon hundreds of years. And the style on the exterior doesn't match the interior very well. Um, this insignia of a shell is basically a symbol of a pilgrim that is representative of Santiago del Capistela because it's on the coast. And so that would show people you'd wear a little patch or you'd carry a souvenir that had this on it. And that would show people when you're walking or moving along the pilgrimage route that you were a pilgrim. So the reason is people wanted to go see the relic, which is the bones of St. James. Santiago is St. James in Spanish. So people will go see this holy object because often they will think a miracle will happen if they go and visit it. So here's the format of the church. Um, you can see how it is different than early Christian churches. The flat roof is gone. Instead, we have the round barrel vaults, very Roman-like, and you can really see how tall these churches are. So Romanesque churches have large interior naves with barrel arches. They have rounded arches, so we have these colonnades in the side aisles. And then, then they have these massive compound piers. Notice how the, the ceiling is held up by a bundle of columns. And then there's this transverse arch. So this thing that goes all the way to the side and then it loops around the ceiling for extra support. The wooden ceilings are gone. Those flat wooden ceilings are gone. And instead they're replaced with masonry or stone roofs. So you can see how often these churches would either have one side aisle or two side aisles to ex expand it for those populations. So we're going to focus on the parts of a Romanesque church. You can go ahead and fill out the illustration in study guide 55. All right, we're going to draw on this. And the reason for it is that we're going to need to know these parts for the uh, Church of St. Foy. Okay, so this looks a little bit different than our typical basilica format church. 
one of the things that you'll notice, and this happened in the early medieval time period as well, is that instead of a typical basilica, which looked like this, they added the cross symbol going across. And we call that the transept. So the transept, right, goes perpendicular to the nave. And so now the church has the symbol of Christianity being the cross. Okay, so let's go ahead and finish up kind of looking at um, what parts of this were perfect for it being a uh, pilgrimage church. So on the very end here, okay, we have our narthex. So we know that a narthex is an entranceway into a church. Notice that on either side of them with these crosses, these are towers. So towers would have been used, right, to make the entrance of the church obvious. You would know that this would be the side of the church that you would enter. And there would be two doorways here that you could go into the interior of the church. Okay. So then, as you... Um, go, right, we have the center part right here, right, we have our nave, and of course the central aisle of our nave is going to be used for long processionals. So if you wanted to and you have colored pencils, you could always, right, you could always color this in for yourself, right, to know where the, save, the nave is, right, you could always color in the transept, right? I'm not gonna color in all of this, but you can kind of get an idea if that helps you to identify these parts. On either side of these churches, we have our side aisles. So that's illustrated right here, there's two arrows. So our side aisles, right, are gonna be large. And so we can have pilgrims come into the church and they can actually walk through the side aisles up to the transept and then up to the front and behind the altar and they can ceremoniously walk around the church on the interior. That would allow them not to be in the way of maybe any processionals that were taking place in the center but also a lot of these side aisles would have chapels, places to light candles, places to leave offerings. And you see a lot of those chapels up in the transept as well as in the apse end. Okay, so as a pilgrim, you'd walk in, typically on the right side, you walk through the right, right? You go through these side aisles, right? And then you lead yourself to this apse. So we know what an apse is. It has a side aisle here, and then there is a rounded walkway. That is called an ambulatory. Okay, that just means it's a rounded aisle, right? And this allows you to walk and to see these different chapels. So we often call these occipital chapels or radiating chapels. And so often in here, these would be different chapels to leave offerings to the different saints and martyrs that would be depicted inside the churches. Sometimes there would be relics also there as well. Okay. So those are probably the main parts that would help you as a pilgrimage. Um, in between the apse and the transept, at the very top, um, we'd have this crossing, or the very center, I should say, we have this crossing, and that's gonna be a crossing tower. You're gonna see that tower on the interior, but mostly on the exterior. That would mark from a distance to a pilgrim, they would be able to see the church because the church would be large and then there would be this tall tower kind of as a beacon that that was the location that they were trying to get to. Okay. Other parts of this 
would be um, that are kind of uh, common in Romanesque and Gothic churches is these posts, right? So you can see there's a series of columns. Those are your compound piers. Oops, spelled that wrong. Compound piers and your transverse arches. So those would be the things, and you can see it kind of in this illustration. This would be these bundles that would hold up these tall ceilings, and the transverse arches would be half columns that would be extra support to hold up that stone, right? This is one of the reasons why these church could, churches could be so tall, okay? On the exterior, right, we have these thickened areas. These are called buttresses. And these would be exterior posts that would be used for extra support. This little square rectangle that we have in here, right? This is supposed to denote a section. This is called a bay. A lot of churches are divided into uh, symbolic numbers. So a lot of times it would be like 12s or 3s or 4s used um, to symbolize different Christian meaning. And then I have another arrow here, but I think it's just pointing to another, it's probably either for the, um, the compound pier or the transverse arches, right? So those are the different parts of a church. And I would focus on the ones that you will see at St. Foy. So I'm going to zip through this part, but here you can see these things that would be used. So the side aisles above them, right, you would walk through there as a pilgrim, but then above them would often be extra seating, sometimes for women, just sometimes for other people as well, um, depending on how crowded the church was. Right, we have um, our transepts, so that cross area, sometimes there's entrances there too, and so that would allow pilgrims to get in there as well. Most of the time people would enter through the narthex, but if you were there during a religious holiday, you might need to have people coming through these side doors as well. Here's an illustration of the Occipital Chapel. This is St. Serin, by the way, another Romanesque church, right? Here's the facade of it, very austere. And then the interior looks a lot like Santiago del Capistela. Right. We go down south, we can see the differences in the style. This is Romanesque during, um, in um, Tuscany, so this is in Pisa. So that Leaning Tower of Pisa is a part of an entire complex at the Cathedral of Pisa. It's got a lot of Roman characteristics with the use of marble. Um, the Leaning Tower of Pisa is a, um, a, 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 a bell tower, right? And then once upon a time, this griffin, this Islamic griffin, used to be at the top of this dome. The interior doesn't have the round barrel vaults, right? Instead, it has the very Roman flat wooden ceilings instead with coifers. And you can see the use of marble interiors. Going a little farther south, a lot of Roman churches look very Byzantine. So this is San Clemente. So we have a lot of flat mosaic. So we've got that early Christian motif. Go a little bit more north, right? This is in Lombard. So Milan has Sant'Ambrosia. And so this church is connected to a monastery. And so it has groin vaulting. So groin vaulting is a conjunction of two barrel vaults. This was needed because the walls are really thick and so you would want to have extra support so that it wouldn't fall. So Sant Ambrosia is not as tall but it's wide and has really thick walls. You can see that it has extra, so it has the compound piers but it also has rib vaulting. So 
in the conjunction of those two barrel vaults, they'll add masonry, kind of like a skeleton to help support those walls. Here's Germanic region um, style. It tends to be a little bit more austere. This actually has a hundred foot ceilings that are held up with um, groin vaults as well. This is the Spires Cathedral. And then in Normandy, the exterior of it was done in the, the Gothic style, but the interior is mostly Romanesque. So it has these really thick, um, it has thick masonry, which is typical of this style. Um, the window that you see at the end is, was done during the Gothic period, but what we start to see is it transforming from Romanesque to Gothic, because notice how the ceiling no longer has rounded arches, it has pointed arches. And so that pointed arch comes from the Crusades. When they went to the Holy Lands, they saw the Islamic use of pointed arches and found that it was decorative as well as functional. And so you can make the ceilings get taller because a pointed arch is structurally more sound than a rounded arch. So this math of cathedral has things like pointed arches, groin vaulting, ribbing, transverse arches, massive piers, and large engaged columns, those compound piers. It doesn't have compound piers, it has large um, posts instead with these really beautiful patterns on them. This is um, in France, this is St. Catan. And so here you can see some of the variations in style. So sometimes the galleries are divided into three or four, and so they're called triforiums. And so you can see how light and airy these spaces are. A lot of windows are often added and clerestories to let the light come through. And so, the entranceways of these churches often would have architectural or sculptural relief. And so we will see an example of this at St. Foy. So often in the center, we'll have a trumeau figure separating the doorways. And then on the, we'll have a lintel, and then we'll have archivolts. So these rounded arches coming across there, right? Go back to here. And then we have the tympium. So the tympium is gonna be this half circular or pointed arch area. And so there's gonna often be images of Christ and throne, images from revelations, images from, uh, je from um, the gospels in these different entrance ways. But they're all basically welcoming the pilgrims to these churches. Probably one of the most famous um, tympiums is the one by Gislibertes at St. Uh, Lazare in Atun. Um, this is a really fun um, example. We actually know the name of the artist here. So on the uh, right side, that's where you enter. So remember, there's typically two doors. On the right side, when you walk in, you will notice hell. Right? So that is a reminder why you need to be going on your pilgrimage and going into these churches. So you can see angels are, and devils are weighing the souls of the newly deceased. The newly deceased are at the very bottom, and you can see them kind of waiting their judgment. And these large, creepy hands will pluck you from your waiting in line up to the scales. There's some people waiting like they're pulling out their hair in fear, right? On the right side, we have heavenly Jerusalem. Um, and so here you can see the gates of paradise. You see angels helping, helping the souls who have been allowed into heaven to reach the heights of heaven. And in the very center, you have an image of Jesus in majesty, welcoming you there. Here's an example of um, one of those historiated columns. So a column that is decorated with um, an illustration. So that is the end of the introduction to Romanesque.